um, to your direct consumer business. So with that, um, you know, want to hand it off to Darius from Ad Kings, and then he can take it away. And then again, remember questions on the right hand side. We'll have some time at the end for questions. Ask us anything. Cool. So first of all, thank you for having me here. And today, basically, I'll be talking about Facebook ads, introducing a little bit more about you know how to get started with Facebook ads the right way. And in general, you know what you need to be successful with Facebook ads because it's much more than just Facebook ads itself. And to start the presentation, I guess I would maybe want to start with the power of Facebook ads. I'm just presenting maybe a few of the case studies so people would be aware of what's actually out there possible when you kind of do the Facebook ads correctly. So these are two case studies that happened like this year. Of course, there's a little bit of corona effect to them and additional scale, etc. But for example, in the first case study, we took like a tech e-commerce business from averaging 200 k per month for wool last year, right? And we were like always struggling to go over 250k per month mark. And this year, we, it took us like about three months of preparation to make this happen. But basically, in 30 days, we were able to almost 4x their highest month. So basically, we were able to hit 862k per month. And I personally do not know literally any other marketing channel where it would be possible to do anything similar like this and scale as hard and as fast as with Facebook ads. And in another case study on the right, actually, we were able to take a business from 200K per month to 3.7 million per month in just two months of scaling. So it means, and what's interesting with this business was relatively new. I mean, they were like in the market for nine months or so before starting to work with us. And it's, you know, majority of its revenue, like 95, 97% of its revenue is driven from Facebook ads. So Facebook ads could allow a lot of businesses to scale quickly and rapidly, but at the same time, it's very important to understand that it's not a magic goose and you kind of have to understand limitations of it and what it is for, you know, because profit out of these numbers isn't that huge and it isn't huge, as huge as you're thinking. So, yeah. So let's talk about um, success formula, right? So first of all, there is like a one part, there is an offer, there is a creative, and there is media buying techniques. So let's start by talking about the offer that is really needed to be successful with Facebook ads. And to create a good offer, technically you have to start with doing a good research about the customer. And this is kind of like gray area that I believe, you know, just by personally talking to a lot of business owners, etc. I personally see a lot of business owners missing out on because you have to understand your consumers' dreams, desires, fears, literally like better than they do themselves. And I could present like a good case study here. For example, this was one of the researches that I was doing myself for a client and the client was selling compression socks. And in a way you would think that, hey, compression socks only are for sports people, for people that are working, you know, a full day, et cetera. But when I went into Amazon and actually started to read through comments, I understood that literally like 20% of the users are nurses and very specifically not the doctors, but nurses. And by aiming at this kind of point, I was able to understand, hey, maybe there's like a certain wording that people are using in this work position. And we even had this kind of like term varicose veins, I think, right? So by using this type of term in ads, we were actually, we were able to increase CTR targeted to certain audiences. Yeah, I think something jumped here. Sorry about that, yeah. Looks like we okay. Okay, that's interesting. Like this slide was actually gone there <laughs> because I was I should have been talking about it, but it kind of like skipped. So oh, maybe I'm back to it. Yeah, I got confused there for a moment. <laughs> yeah, so let me finish about this one. I will get back to the start where uh, it was somehow strange here. Anyways, so just by targeting this thing, we were able to increase the CTRs and a lot of business owners are missing on it. And you know, it's relatively easy to do it. Just pick up a phone, literally call your past customers, take like three or five minutes per customer talk. Hey, what did you like about product? What did you like? You know, how you are using, what you would like to see there, et cetera. And you'll be able to acquire quite a bit of knowledge how to use the product and how to market it correctly. Uh, read Amazon reviews. This is usually a golden medium for me. Uh, I just go there and our whole team goes there and learns about things from there because there are like huge reviews. People literally tell, you know, hey, I received advice from veteran nurse on my first day. Buy yourself a compression socks. It's valuable information for any type of marketer out there, any type of business owner, because you're able to create your offer around this. And also like joint forums, communities, etc. 
And I guess now I will jump back like two slides because for some reason it wasn't there. <laughs> but I will talk more about Facebook ads in general. So you have to think about Facebook ads as an acquisition tool. And why I'm saying, you know, you have to think about it as the acquisition tool because reality is it's not easy to be profitable there. Uh, because there's competition is relatively high, right? And if you want to be acquiring customers and doing high numbers, high scales, it's relatively okay to be running there on just breaking even, right? This means you're not making any profit from Facebook ads. But there are all the other channels, for example, emails, SMSs, and all the retention marketing, etc., that will be bringing you in the profit through, through the upcoming years. So for each customer you're acquiring this moment, uh, technically you would be wanting to make at least 1.6 purchases on average across the first year for him. Of course, there's like a business dependency. If you are like in consumables market, you might even be going as high as 2.5 sales per customer, et cetera. And this is where you are making majority of a profit. So think of Facebook more as an acquisition tool and it's super highly scalable. But at the same time, expect ROAS to be relatively low. So what we are seeing on average is between 1.6 to 3, depending on the niche and scale. This means if a niche is more competitive, let's say supplements or some sort of fashion, jewelry, etc., it's quite likely that you'll be getting 1.6 ROAS even at the low scale, right? And as you will be scaling up, it could actually drop even as low as 1.2, et cetera. And it could be still okay to run if you're like breaking even and making money through other channels. So yeah, just think about Facebook in kind of a different way. Also to use this type of acquisition strategy, you have to make sure you know, you're know you having the right profit margins for a product. And what it means that usually you're kind of spending between 33% to 63% of the whole product price literally on marketing and selling the product. So if a product costs you know 100 bucks, et cetera, you could be spending up to $63 you know, to sell the product. And it could be a good strategy if you are having, let's say, you know, 65% or 85% plus profit margins. This is usually, you know, what's needed to run Facebook ads successfully on acquisition. Of course, you can do remarketing and remarketing could be done, you know, but in my opinion, if you're like using Facebook ads only for remarketing, you're like heavily underutilizing potential of Facebook ads because I have shown you the numbers before, you know, and you're able to really catapult even the beginner business, you know, in, in eight figures category, relatively easy with Facebook ads. And now I'll be getting back into another part of the offer here. So essentially, once you kind of figure out, you know, your avatar and consumer, you want to be hopping in into creating that offer itself. And what I'm seeing with Facebook ads, what works the best is average order value between $50 to $200. And why not cheaper? Because Facebook has, has a click cost and the conversion rate can be just, you know, up to a certain level. This means with cheaper products, it's very hard to make money and be profitable. And you have to sell more to more customers to make the same amount of money. This means you would be having to sell, you know, sometimes uh, five times more products if the product is, you know, priced at $20 versus $100. And this is also like limiting the scalability and, and market, ex, market saturation, et cetera. But these can, are kind of another thing. Another thing, you know, if you're pricing it way above a price point, it becomes suddenly, you know, not an impulsive purchase. This means people need to think about it, do their research. And usually when you're doing research, they might go to your competitors or somewhere else that honestly might be having a better product or just better reviews out there. And for a lot of businesses, it might be hard to get into this product range. And usually the golden sweet spot is about $100 average order value. So my recommendation is just bundle up a product. For example, here on the right, there is an example from a skincare company. What we are doing, they're bundling up their four most popular products into a kit and just offering 10% discount on that. And be a bit creative if your offers because the value has to be quite high, the perceived value of the offer. Uh, for for what the person is paying for. So be creative with it. And for example, the good example on the left versus a Lumen skincare, and I didn't find like a good landing page for them. They are kind of using this their total stale style pages. But what we are doing, we are literally offering the product for first month for free. And we are able to do it because we are having financing, etc. But it's kind of such an insanely strong offer that's pretty much anybody would be taking it on. I believe we were having great conversion rates and we were scaling very highly and aggressively due to that. 
So just in general, be creative, think outside of a box. And you know, you could even be adding some digital products on top for free. So if people are buying some sort of bundle, add maybe some sort of course, how to, you know, lose diet or, or use your products to achieve a desired outcome for a person. So be creative and, and you will need to experiment with it. And my experience is, you know, about 90 hype of percent of the things that you're testing will fail. And it's more about being resilient and just testing through things till you find, you know, the things that are working out here. Um, now, once you have kind of resistible offer and at least some sort of initial concept that you want to start out with, you kind of have to present it the right way. And this is usually kind of another huge problem that a lot of people are having problems with. So it's very hard to create a good landing page if you do not have conversion rate optimization knowledge. But if I would have to give one good example, it's just keep it simple, clean, and modern. This is one of our clients. So basically, this is kind of another good idea, but we were having problems selling a lash glue for this client because average order value was so low. People were like converting well enough. We were actually getting like 7% conversion rates, but we weren't able to sell and have high enough average order values. So we went to kind of like trying multiple resistible offers, et cetera. And one of the things that we're working right now actually really well is offering a free lashes as a gift if people are buying multiple stocks of a unit. So this once again helped to increase the average sort of value by I believe $8. And right now we're actually profitable on the software and running quite smoothly. So think outside of the box and present it in a simple, neat manner. And if you want to learn more about conversion optimization, um, I guess I could recommend you just going to our website and under the resources, there is a link into our Facebook group. Join the group and I do have like a series, I think there's like a four videos where I'm going through group members' websites and just breaking down their funnels and their landing pages, giving, you know, critique and the feedback that, you know, people might be able to implement you know, themselves. So yeah, also another maybe could be a good advice, you know, to hire a good landing page designer. And do not think, you know, that you really need to have a full website right now, especially if you're like not selling, you know, apparel products or multiple SQI products. You could be just creating a good landing page and that's enough to test your product and see if it has potential. And if you're like making money from it, you know, it's much easier to invest back into the business, et cetera, and move it from there. So another thing, you know, outside of this trilogy of, you know, offer creatives and media buying skills is creative, right? And in general, there are like two types of creatives and they generally vary by niche. And I would say if you're in apparel, fashion, accessories, or just in general, very visual product that doesn't need a lot of explanation, images and carousels work really well. Uh, and we usually even outperform the videos, in my opinion. So you would need at least four to six images to start, but I re always recommend have more of them, have different products, etc. So for this type of approach to be host, I would recommend it as at least 10 different products with four images each. And if you're in pretty much any other niche and focusing more on lower number SQI products or driving people more towards collection pages, etc., I would say in nine out of 10 cases, video will, will outperform the images. And it's very important to understand why video is needed there uh, because people are kind of attached and attracted towards the moving parts and we have short attention spans. And by keeping a video engaging, I will be talking about it a bit later in presentation, you're able to engage the customer and present your message and your unique selling propositions and offer to a person through the ad much better than you would be able to do it via image itself. And if you're just starting and you want to start completely basically, you know, start with two videos and you would need to have two videos of different sales angles. And what I mean by sales angles, uh, just to mention, you know, uh, before by creating an offer, for example, you identify that your a lot of your target audience is nurses and just people standing at work. So one of the sales angles could be a video about accentuating the problem of, hey, you know, it's painful to be standing like 12 hours a day and working and your legs might be hurting. Another sales angle could be targeting another segment of people. For example, people that are having chronic pain issues, et cetera. And maybe they're like not even working there all day, or maybe there are like old people that are having problems with your legs. And this way you're kind of spreading out your cars a bit wider and increasing your likelihood of success just by having like two angles at least. So this is kind of what I would recommend for a start.
So if you are focusing on photos, right, let's talk more about conversion psychology in the photo ads themselves. So you really have to understand that the image has to be bold and it has to pop out out of the news feed, right? And I personally don't always preach that white background hardly is a killer of CTR. <laughs> and whenever we are like testing, let's say white background versus a black background, back background almost always performs like 33% better. It's kind of like unwritten rule of Facebook advertising. And another thing, my advice, focus on product close-ups. Um, because a lot of people, what you're doing, we're just having images where the product is somewhere in the image and it's small, it's not attractive. And if people see the image, we do not even understand that, hey, the image is about a product and we are selling me this product, not something else. Um, another image style that could work really well, and I always recommend it for apparel, is user-generated style images. This means similar to the one you're seeing on the right, where you're seeing a model with a product, etc. Uh, but you still have to make sure that people understand that, hey, you are selling a product. It's not just, you know, something something basically else out there. So that's kind of 101 about product photos. Another thing is just having a text on them helps a lot. And there are like rules with Facebook where you can't have like more than 20% of a text there. But these are kind of basics. And if you're like working with any type of designer, etc., they will know it. So yeah, that's pretty much it for photos. And right now, let's hop into videos because videos are much more complex topic. And I would I could kind of like divide the video in multiple topics. It's one of our clients videos we have created and filmed. So let's start with the start of a video. And the start of a video has to have a hook. It's usually three to five seconds of a video, which intention is to accentuate the problem and attract people attentions with good movement, etc., or something that would catch attention. So here you would see like first two shots here of 80% of people have difficulty with yellow teeth. That's a hook. And this kind of attracts the attention of people that were having, you know, yellow teeth and accentuating how important the problem is. And here is kind of like just a screenshot, but here you would have like very highly accentuated movement of a product or something, you know, that would differentiate the video outside of the news feed and catch people's attention. Then you introduce the solution, basically the product, etc., and you introduce the unique selling propositions of a product. So this is kind of a quick formula here. For example, you know, and unique selling propositions means, hey, how the product is different from everything else in the market, and how it helps me to solve my problem. So here is that it's just fifteen minutes routine. It saves time and money compared to like a dentist. And it's painless because a lot of people are having averse attention here and averse reaction that it might actually be causing pain to their teeth, et cetera. And once again, we know this because we did market research. And it's very important to do it. In this video, we are not using additional part, but I highly recommend having user reviews or, or some sort of user just narrated testimonials added before the last part, which is call to action. And for these user testimonials, what you can do is just get influencers to leave a quick review about your product and take like five seconds out of that review and just paste them in into the video because it will help to increase credibility and then create kind of like this mass effect that a lot of people are using the product and, and increase the likelihood of people converting. So yeah, and the last part is just call to action. Basically, you have to have strong call to action, whatever is shop now. And if you're having any good, you know, resistible offer, you could even mention it here. But because if you're like testing things just for starters, um, you could do it without like, you know, advanced, you know, offer or something like that mentioned in the video. You still have to have it in the landing page, but you do not necessarily need to have it in the video. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, what, what is about the creative side. And essentially, you know, before kind of launching things with media buying side, etc., I just want to get clear of a few other things that you need to know before, you know, taking things further. So in the past, there was a huge misconception that, well, not a misconception, but in the past, it was a trend with Facebook to go very narrow with targeting. This means you had to identify like exact age gap, exact cities, exact interests that people, you know, Basically, the people would be buying your product, would be going to and and looking for and just target people in a very detailed manner. Lately, with Facebook ads, artificial intelligence became much more 
evolved and and stronger and basically right now the targeting is the easy part right do not overthink it too much just set up like i don't know 10 different targetings run it for a week or two figure out which targetings are working and do like 90 percent of the work on offering creatives and if things are not working you know it's almost always like either offer or the creatives and the sales angles so that's very important to know and the fact that you will have to be focusing 90 percent of your work there and another good rule of thumb is you know how much money you'll be actually have to spend on the campaigns so i would say you know multiply that out of at least you know take the product price multiply it out of three times and i would say this is the bare minimum you would be having to spend per day per campaign so this means if a product is costing you know and you're selling product for a hundred bucks you should be spending at least 300 bucks um, this way, you'll be able to feed enough data for Facebook artificial intelligence to optimize for purchases. And ideally, you should be even spending more than that, you know, at least 10x and running like two campaigns, etc. But I do understand not everybody is having a budget, etc. So I would say good rule of thumb, at least 3x of, of total budget should go uh, towards like daily ad spend. And once again, I will mention, expect to fail on 95% of the things you'll be trying. And over the first one to two weeks, you, you should be just focusing on finding the best audiences, running with the, with what I offered first. This means, you know, if you have two videos, you run it with two videos, and you just figure out the audiences and what's working there. Then you focus the 90% of the work in offers and creatives, and you start testing different things, rotating them. For example, what I would be doing personally, hey, I'm seeing, you know, that creatives is not working. I would be changing creatives multiple times for maybe like two, three weeks. If these creatives, if this offer is not working, I would be changing the offer and then, you know, coming back to the best creatives I was running before. So in majority of cases, it will actually take four to six weeks to get to the profitable point. And that's, you know, if you're relatively lucky. And if you're like, ad spend is lower than 3X and some people are doing it, it could take even like two to three months to get enough data and validation, you know, to figure out, hey, is it working for us or not? And, you know, on the good note, I would just have to say, you know, that keep in mind that, you know, you're, you will still be making some sales in the process. So not all the money that, you know, you're investing in Facebook ads will be lost. It might just be, you know, if these sales are not profitable enough for you to make a profit after the ad spend, but you will still be making some of the money back. So, yeah, that's, I think, kind of majority of the things covered from Facebook ads. All right. Thank you, Darius. Now with that, we're going to pass it on to, so assuming you get a really good Facebook ad strategy, you're starting to see really nice CPA, things are going well with Ad Kings. Well, time to scale it up. You need more money to pay Ad Kings and you need more money to uh, scale up your ads. And Clear Bank will talk about some of the things they've seen um, and we'll take it from there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I mean, obviously I learned a bunch of Thank you for, for taking the time to walk us through that. Um, I'm really excited to chat with you all just as a bit brief background of myself. I used to be on your side. Uh, I started an e-com company probably 10 years ago uh, in the subscription beauty box space. Um, you know, Facebook was nowhere, nowhere near as sophisticated as it was back then. So I think maybe we're a bit lucky <laughs> to not have to know all the things you know today to be successful. Um, but then I've gone the route of in, you know, outside capital to grow another business, and and um, really that's the next phase in this whole evolution is, you know, how do you set your strategy? How do you know when it's actually time to scale? And I'll, I'll talk touch on that very very briefly, um, and then really uh, we'll go into some different forms of funding and how you can think of them relative to to what we do here at ClearBank. Um, one concept that that I actually took from one of our venture partners, a guy named Jesse Horwitz, who runs Hubble Contacts, is this idea of a marginal CPA. And so I thought this is an important part just to, to illustrate once you've kind of mastered your creative, once you feel like you're at a profitable point, once you're able to see that it's you know worth investing more and more dollars, um, I just want you to do a quick sanity check for you guys to understand, you know, am I at the point where I'm generating better marginal returns on my investment dollars or my ad dollars or, or are things getting worse and I need to potentially look at different investment channels. So um, as a very simple example, uh, imagine you're just running a very simple business. You spend $10,000 a month on Facebook and Google and you know you have these kind of resulting customer acquisition numbers. So um, you can see here your average CPA on Facebook is 100 bucks and your average CPA on Google is 125. So in this case, if I'd be raising money and talking about uses of funds, it seems like Facebook's probably 
the, the cheaper channel and where I should scale more. But let's look at another scenario. So let's say we actually increase that budget. You're trying to grow faster, you have more money, um, and you're now up to $15,000 in spend per month um, with slightly different numbers. All of a sudden you're seeing here that um, you know, your, your, your Facebook now average CPA is 130 bucks where your Google's at you know, average 120. Um, really what I care about and what we look about and what we, you know, when we advise some of our companies is actually looking at the margins and how does that actually, how does that increase in spend change in your you know, marginal next customer acquired. So let's say in each channel, you increase your spend by $5,000. For each of these cases, you've acquired 25 more customers on Facebook and 35 more customers on Google. So even though your, your average CPA is you know, slightly higher on Facebook, so Google you know, seems like the place you should be putting your dollars, what's more important is that your marginal CPA is, is much cheaper because you paid, you know, paid $5,000 but but got 10 more customers on Google versus what you got on Facebook. So um, really all that's to say is as you're thinking about what channels to scale in, um, you should really think about not what your averages are, but what does each additional dollar get you, and you want to put those into the, the channels that generate the best return on your investment. So happy to go into that in more detail in the questions as they come through, uh, but that's just one point I wanted to make on, on how to think about scaling your ad channels once you've kind of set up everything and everything is working. So when you're actually thinking about funding your company, there's a few different ways to think about it. Um, and uh, I'm happy to go through these in more detail because um, you know, I've lived through all of them and seen, through, seen all of them. But you can essentially think of four different categories. Um, so you have your, your venture debt, which is very closely tied to equity. So if, you, if you're a company that's had the, the chance to raise uh, you know, a seed round, a series A, and so on from an accredited investor, you have access to both um, you know, equity and debt where you're sharing a piece of your company, um, and otherwise you're providing warrants or some other type of dilution along with covenants to, to get capital. Um, another alternative is to go to your bank. So for smaller businesses, uh, this is often where um, you trade some type of security. So that could be a personal guarantee um, or, or some type of um, other uh, security or liens on your assets. And then otherwise, a lot of the other platforms out there, um, you know, Stripe has capital, Shopify has capital, PayPal has capital. There's a number of different options out there um, these other alternative financing platforms um, all have solutions that you can look at. So really where ClearBank sits is slightly you know, uh, different than, than all these players, where essentially instead of offering um, capital as uh, something with interest, with covenants, with security, we make it entirely unsecured, which means you get access to capital uh, simply as uh, a trade for a percentage of your revenue. And you pay us back as long as it takes to pay us back. Um, and, and otherwise there is no other security, no other time to repay, um, no personal guarantees or anything like that. So it ends up being a, a very flexible form of capital. Um, and inevitably we definitely get questions of how is this different than Shopify capital, Stripe capital, Square capital, and so on. Um, from my perspective as a founder, I would say go after the cost of capital that is cheapest for you, but also uh, think about what are the other services you're getting access to and, and the size of, of advances you can get. Um, what we do is we're able to combine all of your revenue sources across whether you sell on Amazon and Shopify or other places into one larger offer. And outside of that, we offer a lot of other services to help in terms of actually raising an equity round to help buy and sell your business, uh, as well as insights and benchmarking to help you further optimize your business. So how does revenue financing actually work? Um, this is what we specialize here at, at ClearBank. Essentially, once we uh, you know, issue an offer and deploy funds to you, as your business grows, um, you are paying us back as a percentage of sales, which means your repayment ebbs and flows with how your business is doing. If you did great and had a great month, you're paying slightly more. But let's say you ran a number of experiments, as, as we were talking about in the last, uh, last section, they just didn't work out. As you said, you know, 90% of what you try probably won't work out as you planned, and sales aren't at what you had expected. Your repayments um, uh, decline and, and ratchet down to, to, to be in accordance with the size and growth of your business. So it ends up being one of the most flexible forms of capital for you as an entrepreneur, um, so long as, as um, you know, you're, you're continuing to grow. So where this really starts stacking and growing is, is you know, how this model actually works. So you can envision a world where if this is performance today, you've you know, sold, this is um, you know, your past performance history. What we do at ClearBank is we look at that and we try to project what we think your sales will be in the future and it provide capital against that. So you can imagine here, you've now you know, progressed six months forward, you've generated um, you know, some income, and this little gray box is how much capital you have today. This is where it becomes an accelerator to your business. 
So let's say you're generating a, a positive return on ad spend. You can take all of that capital and, and, and dump it into your Facebook or Google ad strategy. The next six months, you'll see more sales and access to more capital. And then it repeats again, more sales, access to more capital. So this is where revenue-based financing becomes a very handy tool, where essentially you can think about it as, as capital that's always on, always available, that ebbs and flows with your business. So you're really kind of matching your return on ad spend with uh, you know, a very reasonable cost of capital. It's a, a flat 6% for any capital you take uh, from clear bank to spend on marketing. Um, and, and just being a, a very powerful strategy that some of our customers have used to take once they have a working ad strategy to grow it and scale it and, and, and accelerate incredibly quickly. So how does this actually work with, with Deliver um, and, and, and their partners like AdKings? Um, we've actually set up a, a great partnership with them where if you've never worked with us before, um, you're getting 10% off of your uh, initial advance through ClearBank when you sign up for Deliver and ClearBank together. So you can go to this link to, to sign up for that. Um, but essentially it's this very interesting flywheel where as you get more capital from ClearBank, you're able to increase your marketing budget and lower your cost of goods sold if, you, if you're spending this on the inventory to actually uh, fulfill all these orders. Um, when you tie that to what we'll cover in the last section about um, lowering your CPA um, through two-day shipping, I think that's kind of the secret sauce here where um, not only do you now have more money to spend, but you're not gonna spend it more efficiently because uh, by offering two-day shipping, you're gonna see a lot more customers taking you up on the offer. Uh, and improving your conversion rates or, or sell-through rates or potentially increasing your AOV. So really what you're going to see here is an impact on getting more capital, increasing your budget, getting better economics on your ads, which helps you drive more sales with you know the same amount of money. And it really just becomes a, a great flywheel and accelerator to grow your business. Um, and so uh, if you guys have questions, um, you know th this is kind of some of the sense of some of the companies that they alluded to at the beginning of who we work with. Folks like Magic Spoon, Untucket, Vinebox, uh, you know, a number of the, the leaders that we're very proud to call members of our portfolio. Um, and, uh, you know, would love to see if we can help you guys achieve your hopes and dreams with uh, with the combination of what we learned in the first session. Hopefully we can provide some some money to do that as well. Um, I don't see any questions in, in the chat. So um, my section was meant to be pretty short and sweet. But uh, if there's anything else uh, any of the panelists want to cover, we can always yeah. uh, jump to the next session. I think that's um, it's really helpful, and thanks, thanks for providing this. I think this slide's actually really great. I mean, you can kind of see this ecosystem's pretty incredible. I think, you know, Deliver, we focus on, you know, building your business beyond just Amazon. And, um, you know, obviously, we talk a lot about Walmart. We talk a lot about eBay, Wish, um, you know, a lot of these newer marketplaces. But one of the areas we've seen merchants be able to actually exceed their business on Amazon and do even more than that is the space. And so, um, you know, you see some of these mer merchants like Magic Spoon and Public Goods and Untucket, um, the level of volume they've been able to get by pretty much employing a lot of these similar strategies, you know, running Facebook ads, running the optimization on the ads, um, and then putting together some really flexible capital behind that and behind those gains um, can get you to scale really quickly. Um, and so, it's a little bit different from Amazon because not everything exists on the same infrastructure. You know, you have to use a little bit of different providers. You have to kind of use both Shopify, use Facebook, things like that. But um, it's something that you can scale very, very quickly if you're willing to put the effort into it. Um, have a bunch of questions for uh, you know Darius and and Playbank. You know, this was actually even a masterclass for me in many ways, and, and I think really helpful. And I think we're going to try to bring some of this more advanced content uh, to sellers as we keep going. Um, oh yeah, so we have the deliver part here. I'll do a real quick section on the deliver part in case you guys aren't aware. Um, we have a fast shipping uh, program um, uh, where you know we were looking at this ecosystem you know around a year ago and we're fascinated by its ability to scale. And so you know when we looked at essentially some of the things Darius is doing on changing the background and, and doing all of these micro optimizations on the ad, we said, okay, well what's going to happen if we put two day and next day delivery on the ad? What's going to happen then? And that question led to this product, um, where now we put two-day and next-day delivery uh, promises on your Facebook and soon to the Instagram ads, uh, where someone essentially sees your product on Facebook, they click on an ad, and they're directed to your Shopify site, uh, and then they they check out direct from your Shopify site. Um, 
And then what we saw with our merchants is that you saw a pretty big reduction in CPA, um, where you know initially you're coming in at twenty dollars CPA. At two day we saw around fifty percent reduction in CPA. Next day around sixty two percent. This changes by vertical. So like CPG vertical, you see us at a really high level. Um, you know even eighty percent discounts on CPA, um, just because if you're selling you know something like a Magic Spoon cereal box uh, and you can get it uh, tomorrow that's going to convert much better than seeing something and you get it, you know, in a week. Um, and it's magnified for CPG. Um, and so I would actually consider shipping a macro optimization. I think when you look at some of these other conversion pieces, they're important. Um, but something like shipping is so fundamental to your offer and so fundamental to your site conversion, uh, that you need to make sure it's quite strong. Um, and so, Every single seller who's actually participated in this program has seen a reduction in CPA. We've not yet seen a seller where it's not reduced in CPA. Um, and almost everyone's been at least 25, 30% reduction in CPA when you look at two day and next day. So um, by and large, been one of the most successful programs we've had. It's also the fastest growing program we have at Deliver. I know we don't talk about it a lot. Again, we talk a lot about on the marketplace side, but this ecosystem is incredibly powerful. It's built to enable you to scale. Once you get really good CPA numbers, then you can, um, you know, then you can get more capital, like from ClearBank, and then you can reinvest in it. Um, and here was one of our merchants, Hey Dude Shoes, um, really long, really large apparel um, or shoe brand um, on Shopify, uh, and they had a very low CPA. You know, they had a CPA of around uh, fifteen dollars going into this, and this is also apparel where you're going to have probably the least amount of sensitivity to fast shipping. And they even saw a 25% reduction in CPA from moving to two day and next day saw even a, a bigger boost. Uh, so where we dropped it from 15 to 11, we even seen dropping CPA from 12 to eight. So, um, and then for merchants, for example, you know, we did have a merchant that kind of fits like that ad Kings profile of an average order value of hundred dollars plus for them, they're seeing those 50, 60% reduction in CPA. Um, but even at the lower end for some of these cheaper goods, you're still seeing that reduction. Um, because buyers are just frankly very, you know, re react very positively to this. Um, and then you have this next day boost. So you have around 40% of users. This has gone down due to COVID. It's around 25% right now. Um, but you get to show next day delivery. If you're in CPG, this is a huge benefit. Um, you know, you're going to see quite a bit of next day coverage. Um, and you're going to have a special ad set created in your Facebook account of all items that are next day enabled. And so you can put a very high budget behind that ad set um, and you can see the, the CPA gains that you make. Um, and what's also cool is that next day delivery, there's no change in cost. So it's the same charge as the two day rate. Uh, it's just a boost. Um, similar like what you see with FBA, you get prime one day as a boost. You don't pay extra prime one day versus prime two day. Um, so this is something where we're continuing to expand. Expect next year that this number increases substantially. Um, and I think that it's going to be a really huge benefit to how you, um, you know, how you advertise and, and, and the efficiency you see on your ads. This is what the seller portal is going to look like. Um, if you guys want to take a look and, and want to, want to opt in, uh, it's basically you're connecting your Shopify to Facebook. Um, you need to make sure you do that first. They have a pre-built plugin. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, then you want to connect your Facebook account to deliver, um, pretty quick. You're going to want to look at your ad structure. So we'll create these different ad sets, uh, one with two day enabled zips, the other one with next day enabled zips. Um, and then you want to go and enable your campaigns. Um, and here you have just the steps in case anyone's curious, you know, it's going to log you into Facebook. You're going to kind of see this deliver logo next to your profile icon, and then you're good to go. Um, and then you're going to see the ad sets. Those are the ad sets. See it deliver two day ad set, deliver next day ad set. And then you can start running bids on those campaigns. Um, and then you can configure your targeting per ad set. And then you just turn on the campaigns. And that's it. And so with that, we'll jump into some questions. Um, and then here's some really helpful resources. I'm actually part of the Ad Kings Facebook group. It's really cool. It's really fun. Um, not spammy. I know like Facebook groups can be really spammy. This one's actually really helpful. And they talk a lot about um, optimization tactics. I think there's like a hundred deliver sellers in there right now. So um, feel free to join the de little deliver faction inside this Facebook group. It's pretty fun. Um, 
And then, yeah, and then here are some of the other resources if you guys, ClearBank or, or AdKings, want to talk a little bit about it. Um, anything for sellers to look out for, and then we'll get into some questions. Okay. All right, let's get into some questions. Um, so um, I actually am changing this up. So I was watching you guys and had a bunch of questions for you guys outside of what we're getting on the feed, but um, subscriptions. So a huge seller base is subscriptions. Um, and I think this goes for both ClearBank and AdKings. Let's start with ClearBank, or let's start with AdKings first and go to ClearBank. How do you model out subscription CPG businesses into your modeling when you look at AOV or when you look on return on investment? Yeah. So essentially, you would need to know, you know, some of the metrics behind the business about the subscription. Uh, you would need to know, you know, average lifetime value of a customer, uh, because this is kind of like the most kind of, you know, the key metric for a subscription business, because for subscription business, pretty much acquisition cost will be way higher compared to regular business. And very interesting, we have run some testing with some of our own clients and we have found, you know, running um, hybrid models almost always the best. This means what you are able to do is you were kind of presenting a people option to buy a product, but then you are upselling them subscription almost in the checkout phase. So, of course, it's not always applicable. For example, you know, I've seen one of the clients of ClearBank, for example, Boxu, right? We are like completely subscription-based business. So we are like running a completely different funnel to what I'm talking here. But if you are just a starter and, you know, running something you more, you know, regular type of business, the best way to transition into subscription, I would say is, you know, just set up a recart um, upsells in, in, in after a purchase. Uh, and then on the clearback side. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think on our side, we kind of see to, to, to Darius's point there, there are some businesses that are, are using this as a way just to generate incremental cash flow, I think. One thing that um, may not make sense for, for every subscription business, but something more of just managing your own cash. And, and this is something that was very successful that we had done in my own subscription company that I'd run uh, many years ago. We, we focus maniacally on getting people onto annual subscription plans, um, which uh, basically we were able to convert about half of our base to pay as one year upfront for our service, which changed our cash version cycle dramatically and, and actually didn't require us to raise a lot of money. So as much as I'd love to say, you know, take lots of money from ClearBank, if there are ways you can use subscription to change your cash flow cycle and not only get someone on a recurring subscription, but actually pay for a, a substantial amount of your of, of your um, product upfront and lock into it, even at a substantial discount, you'll find yourself becoming a lot more flexible in how you manage your business. From a, a valuation perspective or, or capital perspective, um, more often than not, it lets us potentially provide better offers to certain companies um, or potentially longer duration offers. Um, we also do quite a bit on traditional software as a service. And so there are some ways we're able to actually port over that underwriting methodology to work for, for subscription businesses, just because it's a lot more predictable. We're a lot more confident in our predictions, especially when we can actually get a look at your, your cohort analysis and things like that. Um, but really the, the last thing I'd also mention is even if your business is not subscription in nature, um, ideally you're seeing some type of subscription like behavior for the business, or you're going to have to very much uh, modify your, your CAC targets in line. And I think more and more for early stage businesses, we don't see that or don't have enough data. Everyone has become very, very focused on becoming first purchase profitable or first order profitable um, until you're actually confident that people are coming back or you can upsell them with some predictability. Otherwise, you might get yourself into a situation of you're, you're just acquiring customers on a very unprofitable basis um, on the hope that they'll buy something new, but they're not. So um, those are kind of a, a bunch of random thoughts <laughs> about it, but I could I could talk endlessly on that topic. Um, and it's really interesting. A lot of our merchants have that ability to do, and that's something that you have a lot more flexibility when you look at Shopify versus Amazon, the subscription model that you can really invest in and put some customization around it. Um, when we look at, so we want to talk about the elephant in the room, Facebook, Instagram shops. I know it's rolling out. It's been a little bit slower on the rollout, but we're starting to see some of these really big guys get access to buy on Instagram, buy on Facebook. So I know you guys work with some of the largest Shopify accounts out there who most likely got access to it over the past few weeks. So I put you both on the spot. What are you guys seeing in initial conversion? Have you guys been seeing anything yet as these merchants start testing it out? 
I think on, on our end, we, we, all of the money rolls into your central account. So yep. it's hard for me to say on a um, company to company basis, have I seen like a particular bump up in growth? Um, I think one of our, our big partners is big commerce and you can kind of see just in their stock price, it jumped 30% in the day they were announced that they were a part of this shopping ecosystem. Um, so inevitably more distribution channels that require less clicks are, are generally a good idea. And I think the, the broader application I've seen or the broader insight I've seen across some of our best companies is they are literally everywhere. They are on eBay, Walmart, Amazon, D2C, uh, whatever channels they can, they're going to eke out, even if it's like, you know, five, 10, 15% of incremental sales. And as long as you have the fulfillment operations and that, um, that's, that's like how you grow. And then, and then a lot doing stuff offline and wholesale as well. Yeah. Um, unfortunately I can't speak to it, you know, individual and companies that we, we don't see that granularity quite yet. Uh, on a, in the least in our reporting. And yeah, what about on the agency side? Yeah, so I would say, you know, we are like very similar, similar position as ClearBank, you know, um, not all of our clients got access to it. I think it's only one because we are like working in such a boutique model that we are not really having many clients here. So I would say, you know, results are relatively mixed. Um, and I personally, you know, are kind of predicting, you know, that for a lot of businesses, it will be a holy grail. But for some other businesses, it might not be as good as we are expecting because the biggest benefit of a store and a good landing page is because you're able to tell a story in a nice, compelling way that basically captivates attention and keeps it right. By going to the Facebook store, you are still kind of a bit limited across, you know, the options that you're able to customize the product and how to present it. So, you know, we will have to test it because in the past, I think there was like some sort of option to have a store on Facebook, etc. And even the collections that you, you would have ability to check out on, on Facebook itself and it never was working as well as a store. So this is kind of like another important thing. What we found, you know, with these type of ads in the past, that apparel was working really well. Uh, so I'm expecting most likely the same thing to happen here, you know, similar to what they mentioned, you know, with uh, photo ads, right? Apparel, very visual products, jewelry, et cetera, accessories, they all work phenomenally well, but the products that need a lot of explanation, a lot of convincing, usually supplements and more complex products, most likely landing pages will still be a go-to way. Got it, got it. So more visceral products we're expecting is going to be do better on more of a seamless experience which makes sense i mean you're seeing nike adidas i i, I saw yesterday those guys all have uh, instagram shops set up already um so you can actually just transact on instagram to purchase nike shoes now which is pretty insane um and then you know want to bring in some audience questions and thanks for getting uh, a good amount here kyle daniel jay um you know crystal um so Daniel asked a really good question and leave your questions on the right hand side. I, I know you guys have been really good about even answering questions in real time there. Um, Ad Kings and ClearBank are answering your questions as they come up. But, um, you know, we had a really good question here from Daniel. When adopting faster shipping options to reduce CPA, um, do you risk also reducing your margins for all, for all of your sales on that channel uh, with your existing customer base who are already happy with standard delivery? This comes up a lot and this is a big component and this is something that you have to set really model out and kind of model out differences. There's also ways that you can do it where you can set up, uh, you know, special landing pages to test that are only two day enabled and you can only two day enable those landing pages. You have questions around how to set it up. It's what we call a CPA experiment at Deliver and we've set this up for a lot of our major merchants. Like for example, hate shoes, how to set up like that. And, We've done similar things with um, a few other guys. And so that can create this customized two-day delivery experience, just moving to this direct PDP. Um, and, and then you risk um, you know, cannibalization, essentially, of your margin with your, with your broader customer base that already just goes to your homepage. Um, now, eventually, though, you probably will have to make a decision because those users are probably going to you know, you have a CPG product or something like that, they're going to want to purchase again. And uh, it's possible they're going to want to see two-day delivery again, but it's also possible they're okay with standard. So that is something you have to think about. It's something you have to test. Um, I think if, if that's the state your business is in, run it through testing, probably don't go all or nothing and then get to a commitment either way. 
run some testing, run some analysis, then kind of ease into it. Um, we have seen traditionally, you do see that the existing buyers tend to purchase more when you add two day delivery uh, and next day delivery. So it ends up being a net positive, but that being said, each business is different, um, which is why I'd recommend testing. And then a really good question here from Crystal as well. Um, you know, do you recommend faster shipping when a store's best selling items are around five to $9? We already charge $3.99 for orders under $20, free shipping for orders over $20. So I think this is where the bundling component that Darius was talking about is really important. Um, I think for that five to $9 item, you probably have to charge for shipping. Um, you know, I've seen this, fast shipping work on this channel up to like $11 items. Uh, anything below that's really tough. And I think you're kind of splitting hairs at that point. Um, but when you look at uh, bundling items, and actually one of the questions I'm gonna ask you guys, is what are your favorite bundling plugins? Uh, you know, one really common one is like Bold Commerce that a lot of our sellers use. And um, anyway, so if you can bundle that and then you can two day enable the bundles. And so that's a way you can drive up AOV on your store. And that's been really common among deliver sellers. It's just really interesting how sellers have been using this. They're, we're seeing all sorts of different tactics. It's probably one of the most flexible um, products we have out there. Um, so we've seen sellers create bundles and then they're two day enabling the bundles and they're pushing out AOV that way. So really good question on there. Um, and then last question I had for, you know, I guess ClearBank and AdKings was on budgets. So we talked a lot about testing. We talked about 5% of testing is going to work. 95% of testing is going to fail. However, that only works with a certain budget, right? So at that level, you need to be putting in a certain level of capital to be able to make this work. And I know it's kind of a hard question because it kind of depends on the business, kind of depends on the vertical, but if you had to give ranges, what would you say is a daily budget? If you want to say, okay, I want to start getting ready, start seeing, okay, can, can a website really work for me? Can I really start scaling this and make this as big as my Amazon channel where I do a thousand dollars a day? What do you think is that daily budget that they need to do and how long do they need to spend that? Yeah, so essentially this goes back to what I mentioned before, you know, by it all depends on the average sort of value that you're selling product because, you know, if you're like selling product that costs only 20 bucks to get a free sale, so you need to spend less, right? Versus you would be selling 150 bucks product. But I would say, you know, in general, you should be expecting to commit between like three to six thousand uh, dollars for a month, you know, to get some sort of decent data. And usually by this amount, you know, you're able to get, you know, a glimpse. Hey, is it working for me? Is it not? You know, what's bad there? And, you know, usually by pinpointing and, you know, literating, changing things, whatever that's offer, landing page, um, the ads, etc. you're able to get to a good spot with pretty much majority of the businesses. It's just that a lot initial project and initial traction takes a lot of time. This is kind of the hardest part. And on the clear bank side, when is it that you guys look at in, you know, giving capital advances? What's kind of been a number that you want to see already that's already been invested? Are you looking for that similar number, three to six K monthly? Are you looking for a little bit more? How do you guys think about it? Yeah, so for, for our core marketing um, use case, uh, our companies are at least doing um, ten thousand dollars in in revenue a month. Um, you know, which which could correlate to probably the lower end of that budget. Um, they're probably spending a little bit less, depending on like how much margin they have to play with. Um, more recently, though, we've started funding companies at an even earlier stage than that with a, a slightly different offer through our ClearBank Ventures program. Um, I think broadly speaking. The framework I like to use on marketing budget and marketing spend is, is marketing is just another investment product. That's essentially what we've done at ClearBank is we've taken this investment class or this investment asset where you put in some money and then it generates some return in case your return has been your ROAS. And when you factor in your contribution margin, your lifetime value, there essentially is this, this monetary uh, uh, financial instrument you've created with, with Facebook or the ecosystem. So. The way I almost think about budget and the way we kind of encourage our, our portfolio companies to think about it, so long as you are generating a positive return on investment on your ads relative to your profitability on the product, lifetime value, and so on, as long as all those things hold, um, you you really have an uncapped budget until that stops being profitable for that channel because it's money you're leaving on the table by not 
pouring you know incredible amounts of dollars into that channel. Obviously, as you scale, it's not a linear equation that'll be profitable forever. Um, so the way I think about budgets, it's it's basically an optimization formula of like within within let's say Facebook and Google is probably your number two number one number two places where you spend dollars. Um, if you're on Amazon, maybe you're spending money on the Amazon uh, ad ecosystem as well. Um, how do you just drive down that marginal CPA to to the number that is 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 palatable for your business? And then basically, you know, stop spending or adjust your economics uh, uh, if if you're not seeing that good return on investment. So it's kind of an empty, not direct answer for your question, um, but just think about it like investing in stocks. Honestly, it's like uh, that's that's really what it is. It's a repeatable investment, um, and and so long as you're disciplined about your return on investment, um, there there really should be no no cap to it if it fits in that formula. So we've talked about monthly budget. So it sounds like we're kind of thinking. $2,000, $3,000 a month on the low end, right? Um, so it looks like we had questions. These are actually questions that people asked before, you know, before the webinar. So we have a question here. What's the usual ROAS? What's the usual like CPA? What is kind of a typical, you know, you mentioned just now earlier, um, you need to have a CPA that's palatable for your business. What have you seen as really strong CPA? And let's assume like an average order value of $50. Um, or, or a typical ROAS, and how do you look at CPA yeah. versus ROAS? Do you look at them differently, or which one do you like to look at better? Um, so yeah, like CPA, ROAS, I mean, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin, right? So ROAS yeah. is technically, you are also like taking into consideration how much you're making through average order value, et cetera. And CPA is kind of like leaving it a bit more in there. So I would say, you know, the core metric to focus is ROAS, right? And about good ROAS, I mentioned, you know, it's it's so niche dependent, it's so market dependent, it's so product dependent, so offer dependent, you know. I would say if you are like in more competitive niches, 1.6 could be relatively good, right? But you have to take in mind, you know, that you have to run like a full funnel strategy. This means the more sophisticated business you're running as e-commerce, you know, the more marketing channels you should be doing. And to be frank, you know, some of our clients are losing money on acquisition side, but we're making so much cash back through emails, retention, and repeated purchases. But the mathematics just makes sense. And we are literally making, you know, very good profit margins in value, you know, that which is usually 20, 30 percent. That's fascinating. So they're negative on their yeah. ad acquisition, but yeah. they retain so well they make back the margin. Yeah, for example, we have a client that we spent like 150 bucks to acquire a customer, right? Yeah. But a customer has like $850 average order value, um, LTV, sorry, not, not average order value, LTV. So we make like three and a half purchases over a year. So, you know, by acquiring a customer earlier, we can let it sit, you know, and over the year we'll be making our money back. And then you can another metric. Similarly, right? Yeah. With CPG, if you're in subscription, your LTV. Yeah. Increases it's very similar. You actually lose money on that initial ad and, yeah. and model it on an LTV basis versus a, a single purchase basis. Exactly. This is kind of like this approach. Also, like another thing to look at could be like store level return on the ad spend, where you are combining different ad spends across different channels, whether that's Facebook, AdWords, YouTube ads, etc. And you're seeing clear returns what you're getting that day on the store level. Because the store level returns should be way higher than you are seeing on Facebook because like emails will be added, all the repeated purchases, etc. So usually, you know, depending on the store, but we could be running, let's say, Facebook ads at 1.8 ROS, right? But the store level ROS could be 2.5, which is, you know, really good, very profitable at good scale. Yeah. All right, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. What about on the clear bank side? What's the level yeah. that you're really looking for in that CPA? And I, I know Darius just kind of Changes the whole nature of the question, so it's actually more based on <laughs> LTV, which is very true. But what are the yeah, yeah? I think I, I'm 100 percent in support of the same message because it, it, it to me it just comes down to like what is their likelihood of coming back. So I, I know you gave this example of like a 50 dollar AOV. Like I like to think about it. Let's say if you're one of the you know the kind of the the the, the kings of of D to C started with. Uh, I'd probably say, you know, I'd like the Warby Parkers of the world, but you also have like the mattress company. So you look at Casper, Helix, Lisa, whatever. They have whatever, an $800 AOV, but it's just one purchase. Like a mattress, the chances of you buying another mattress that year is pretty Four. much zero. Yeah. So you have to nail it and be first order prof, first purchase profitable, yeah. unless you're at the scale where they are now, where they'll sell you a pillow and a blanket and all that other stuff. But I still bet you that, um, you know, it, it really has to convert 
on that first purchase and be profitable or else you're gonna waste a ton of money. Um, where if you if you have some semblance of them coming back and the math works out, that that's my earlier point of all businesses in some way should be subscription like, even if they're not a subscription business. If you'd say a jewelry company, you have four seasons, you probably have different types of collections. So you want them to come back fall, winter, spring, summer. Um, whereas if you're, let's say, a, a, a bikini company or sunscreen or something like that, you're probably going to do all of your sales in May to July, August at the latest, and then sell nothing for the rest of the year. And so if you're acquiring someone in August, I would ratchet down my CPA because I'm not going to see any money from that person. But if it's in May, maybe I'm willing to pay a bit more because I'll have four months to convert them with new collections and stuff like that. So it all comes down to LTV and like timing of when these purchases happen. And then tying that to your cash flow as well of like, could you afford to finance, uh, you know, acquiring $150, even if you don't make first order profitable, can you roll that and survive, you know, for four purchases before you make your money back? That's fascinating. I think that's really interesting. Um, we definitely need to do, we need to have you guys write blogs for the deliver blog. So we need to talk <laughs> about this more. Uh, we're out of time, uh, but thanks so much, guys. Um, this is probably one of the most interesting ones we've you know webinars we've done i know we got a little bit advanced a little bit at the end but um this is really important stuff you know like what clearbank was just saying understanding if where you are in the season are you going to have kind of a subscription light in apparel and uh you know then you can uh you know spend a little bit more aggressively at the beginning of the season versus the end of end of the season so um you know uh i hope you guys enjoyed it we'll we'll try to have ad kings and clear bank on here more um to give these really helpful tidbits as obviously you know facebook ig shops continues to roll out uh we'll try to do some sort of update um in holiday where we, where we talk about uh things we're seeing there but um thanks again everyone thanks so much guys ad king clear bank for coming on um i actually have to jump to a call hey do you choose coincidentally i'll bring up some of the things we just talked about um, which I thought was pretty fun. Thanks so much, guys. There's going to be a recording of this webinar um, in case you missed it or if you have any other questions. And then we have the resources that we uh, we just talked about. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Cool. See ya. Yeah. Bye. Cheers.